Chapter Thirteen: The Fellow of No Delicacy. If Sidney Carton ever shone anywhere, he certainly never shone in the house of Doctor Manette. He had been there often during a whole year, and had always been the same moody and morose lounger there. When he cared to talk, he talked well, but the cloud of caring for nothing, which overshadowed him with such a fatal darkness, was very rarely pierced by the light within him and yet he did care something for the streets that environed that house and for the senseless stones that made their pavements many a night he vaguely and unhappily wandered there when wine had brought no transitory gladness to him many a dreary daybreak revealed his solitary figure lingering there and still lingering there when the first beams of the sun brought into strong relief removed beauties of architecture in spires of churches and lofty buildings as perhaps the quiet time brought some sense of better things else forgotten and unattainable into his mind of late the neglected bed in the temple court had known him more scantily than ever and often when he had thrown himself upon it no longer than a few minutes he had got up again and haunted that neighbourhood on a day in august when mr stryver after notifying to his jackal that he had thought better of that marrying matter had carried his delicacy into devonshire and when the sight and scent of flowers in the city streets had some waifs of goodness in them for the worst of health for the sickliest and of youth for the oldest sidney's feet still trod those stones from being irresolute and purposeless his feet became animated by an intention and in the working out of that intention they took him to the doctor's door he was shown upstairs and found lucy at her work alone she had never been quite at her ease with him and received him with some little embarrassment as he seated himself near her table but looking up at his face in the interchange of the first few commonplaces she observed a change in it i fear you are not well mr carton no but the life i lead miss manette is not conducive to health what is to be expected of or by such profligates is it not for, forgive me i have begun the question on my lips a pity to live no better life god knows it is a shame then why not change it looking gently at him again she was surprised and saddened to see that there were tears in his eyes there were tears in his voice too as he answered it is too late for that i shall never be better than i am i shall sink lower and be worse he leaned an elbow on her table and covered his eyes with his hand the table trembled in the silence that followed she had never seen him softened and was much distressed he knew her to be so without looking at her and said pray forgive me miss manette i break down before the knowledge of what i want to say to you will you hear me if it will do you any good mr carton if it would make you happier it would make me very glad god bless you for your sweet compassion he unshaded his face after a little while and spoke steadily don't be afraid to hear me don't shrink from anything i say i am like one who died young all my life might have been no mr carton i am sure that the best part of it might still be i am sure that you might be much much worthier of yourself say of you miss manette and although i know better although in the mystery of my own wretched heart i know better i shall never forget it she was pale and trembling he came to her relief with a fixed despair of himself which made the interview unlike any other that could have been holden if it had been possible miss manette that you could have returned the love of the man you see before you flung away wasted drunken poor creature of misuse as you know him to be he would have been conscious this day and hour in spite of his happiness that he would bring you to misery bring you to sorrow and repentance blight you disgrace you pull you down with him i know very well that you can have no tenderness for me i ask for none i am even thankful that it cannot be without it can i not save you mr carton 
Can I not recall you, forgive me again, to a better course? Can I in no way repay your confidence? I know this is a confidence, she modestly said, after a little hesitation, and in earnest tears. I know you would say this to no one else. Can I turn it to no good account for yourself, Mr. Carton? He shook his head. To none. No, Miss Manette, to none. If you will hear me through a very little more, all you can ever do for me is done. I wish you to know that you have been the last dream of my soul. In my degradation, I have not been so degraded, but that the sight of you with your father, and of this home made such a home by you, has stirred old shadows that I thought had died out of me. Since I knew you, I have been troubled by a remorse that I thought would never reproach me again, and have heard whispers from old voices impelling me upward that I thought were silent for ever. I have had unformed ideas of striving afresh, beginning anew, shaking off sloth and sensuality, and fighting out the abandoned fight, a dream, all a dream that ends in nothing, and leaves the sleeper where he lays down but i wish you to know that you inspired it will nothing of it remain oh mr carton think again try again no miss manette all through it i have known myself to be quite undeserving and yet i have had the weakness and have still the weakness to wish you to know with what a sudden mastery you kindled me heap of ashes that i am into fire a fire however inseparable in its nature from myself quickening nothing lighting nothing doing no service idly burning away since it is my misfortune mr carton to have made you more unhappy than you were before you knew me don't say that miss manette for you would have reclaimed me if anything could you will not be the cause of my becoming worse since the state of your mind that you describe is at all events attributable to some influence of mine this is what i mean if i can make it plain can i use no influence to serve you have i no power for good with you at all the utmost good that i am capable of now miss manette i have come here to realize let me carry through the rest of my misdirected life the remembrance that i opened my heart to you last of all the world and that there was something left in me at this time which you could deplore and pity which i entreated you to believe again and again most fervently with all my heart was capable of better things mr carton entreat me to believe it no more miss manette i have proved myself and i know better i distress you i draw fast to an end will you let me believe when i recall this day that the last confidence of my life was reposed in your pure and innocent breast and that it lies there alone and will be shared by no one if that will be a consolation to you yes not even by the dearest one ever to be known to you mr carton she answered after an agitated pause the secret is yours not mine and i promise to respect it thank you and again god bless you he put her hand to his lips and moved towards the door be under no apprehension miss manette of my ever resuming this conversation by so much as a passing word i will never refer to it again if i were dead that could not be surer than it is henceforth in the hour of my death i shall hold sacred the one good remembrance and shall thank and bless you for it that my last avowal of myself was made to you and that my name and faults and miseries were gently carried in your heart may it otherwise be light and happy he was so unlike what he had ever shown himself to be and it was so sad to think how much he had thrown away and how much he every day kept down and perverted that lucy manette wept mournfully for him as he stood looking back at her 
"'Be comforted,' he said. "'I am not worth such feeling, Miss Manette. "'An hour or two hence, and the low companions "'and low habits that I scorn but yield to "'will render me less worth such tears as those "'than any wretch who creeps along the streets. "'Be comforted, but within myself I shall always be towards you "'what I am now, though outwardly I shall be "'what you have heretofore seen me.' the last supplication but one i make to you is that you will believe this of me i will mr carton my last supplication of all is this and with it i will relieve you of a visitor with whom i well know you have nothing in unison and between whom and you there is an impassable space it is useless to say it i know but it rises out of my soul for you and any dear to you i would do anything if my career were of that better kind that there was any opportunity or capacity of sacrifice in it i would embrace any sacrifice for you and for those dear to you try to hold me in your mind some quiet times as ardent and sincere in this one thing the time will come the time will not be long in coming when new ties will be formed about you ties that will bind you yet more tenderly and strongly to the home you so adorn the dearest ties that will ever grace and gladden you oh miss manette when the little picture of a happy father's face looks up in yours when you see your own bright beauty springing up anew at your feet think now and then that there is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you he said farewell said at last god bless you and left her end of book two chapter thirteen Chapter 14. The Honest Tradesman To the eyes of Mr. Jeremiah Cruncher, sitting on his stall in Fleet Street with his grisly urchin beside him, a vast number and variety of objects in movement were every day presented. Who could sit upon anything in Fleet Street during the busy hours of the day and not be dazed and deafened by two immense processions, one ever tending westward with the sun, the other ever tending eastward from the sun, both ever tending to the plains beyond the range of red and purple where the sun goes down? with his straw in his mouth mr cruncher sat watching the two streams like the heathen rustic who has for several centuries been on duty watching one stream saving that jerry had no expectation of their ever running dry nor would it have been an expectation of a hopeful kind since a small part of his income was derived from the pilotage of timid women mostly of a full habit and past the middle term of life from telson's side of the tides to the opposite its shore brief as such companionship was in every separate instance mr cruncher never failed to become so interested in the lady as to express a strong desire to have the honour of drinking her very good health and it was from the gifts bestowed upon him towards the execution of this benevolent purpose that he recruited his finances as just now observed time was when a poet sat upon a stall in a public place and mused in the sight of men mr cruncher sitting on a stall in a public place but not being a poet mused as little as possible and looked about him it fell out that he was thus engaged in a season when crowds were few and belated women few and when his affairs in general were so unprosperous as to awaken a strong suspicion in his breast that mrs cruncher must have been flopping in some pointed manner when an unusual concourse pouring down fleet street westward attracted his attention looking that way mr cruncher made out that some kind of funeral was coming along and that there was popular objection to this funeral which engendered uproar young jerry said mr cruncher turning to his offspring it's a burying hurrah father cried young jerry the young gentleman uttered this exultant sound with mysterious significance the elder gentleman took the cry so ill that he watched his opportunity and smote the young gentleman on the ear 
What do you mean? What are you hoo-roaring at? What do you want to come way to your own father, you young rip? This boys are getting too many for me, said Mr. Cruncher, surveying him. Him and his hoo-roars. Don't let me hear no more of you, or you shall feel some more of me, do you hear? I want doing no harm, young Jerry protested, rubbing his cheek. "'Drop it, then,' said Mr. Cruncher. "'I won't have none of your no-arms. "'Get atop of that there seat and look at the crowd.' His son obeyed, and the crowd approached. They were bawling and hissing round a dingy hearse and dingy mourning-coach, in which mourning-coach there was only one mourner, dressed in the dingy trappings that were considered essential to the dignity of the position. The position appeared by no means to please him, however, with an increasing rabble surrounding the coach, deriding him, making grimaces at him, and incessantly groaning, and calling out, "'Ya, spies!' Tst! Ya, ya, spies! with many compliments too numerous and forcible to repeat. Funerals had at all times a remarkable attraction for Mr. Cruncher. He always pricked up his senses and became excited when a funeral passed Telson's. Naturally, therefore, a funeral with this uncommon attendance excited him greatly, and he asked of the first man who ran against him, "'What is it, brother? What's it about?' "'I don't know,' said the man. "'Spies! Ya, ya! Spies!' He asked another man. "'Who is it?' "'I don't know,' returned the man, clapping his hands to his mouth nevertheless, and vociferating in a surprising heat, and with the greatest ardour. "'Spies! Ya, ya! Spies!' At length a person better informed on the merits of the case tumbled against him, and from this person he learned that the funeral was the funeral of one Roger Cly. "'Was he a spy?' asked Mr. Cruncher. "'Old Bailey spy,' returned his informant. "'Ya, ya, ya, old Bailey spies!' "'Why, to be sure!' exclaimed Jerry, recalling the trial at which he had assisted. "'I've seen him. Dead, is he?' "'Dead as mutton,' returned the other, "'and can't be too dead. Have em out, they're spies! Pull em out, they're spies!' The idea was so acceptable in the prevalent absence of any idea that the crowd caught it up with eagerness, and loudly repeating the suggestion to have em out and to pull em out, mobbed the two vehicles so closely that they came to a stop. On the crowds opening the coach doors, the one mourner scuffled out of himself and was in their hands for a moment, but he was so alert and made such good use of his time that in another moment he was scouring away up a by-street after shedding his cloak, hat, long hat-band, white pocket-handkerchief, and other symbolical tears. These the people tore to pieces, and scattered far and wide with great enjoyment, while the tradesmen hurriedly shut up their shops, for a crowd in those times stopped at nothing, and was a monster much dreaded. They had already got the length of opening the hearse to take the coffin out, when some brighter genius proposed instead its being escorted to its destination amidst general rejoicing. Practical suggestions being much needed, this suggestion, too, was received with acclamation, and the coach was immediately filled with eight inside and a dozen out, while as many people got on the roof of the hearse as could, by any exercise of ingenuity, stick upon it. Among the first of these volunteers was Jerry Cruncher himself, who modestly concealed his spiky head from the observation of Telson's in the further corner of the morning coach. The officiating undertakers made some protest against these changes in the ceremonies, but, the river being alarmingly near, and several voices remarking on the efficacy of cold immersion in bringing refractory members of the profession to reason, the protest was faint and brief. The remodelled procession started, with a chimney-sweep driving the hearse, advised by the regular driver who was perched beside him, under close inspection for the purpose, and with a pie-man, also attended by his cabinet minister, driving the morning coach. A bear-leader, a popular street character of the time, was impressed as an additional ornament, before the cavalcade had gone far down the strand. 
and his bear, who is black and very mangy, gave quite an undertaking air to that part of the procession in which he walked. Thus, with beer-drinking, pipe-smoking, song-roaring, and infinite caricaturing of woe, the disorderly procession went its way, recruiting at every step, and all the shops shutting up before it. Its destination was the old church of St. Pancras, far off in the fields. It got there in course of time, insisted on pouring into the burial-ground finally accomplished the interment of the deceased roger cly in its own way and highly to its own satisfaction the dead man disposed of and the crowd being under the necessity of providing some other entertainment for itself another brighter genius or perhaps the same conceived the humour of impeaching casual passers-by as old bailey spies and wreaking vengeance on them chase was given to some scores of inoffensive persons who had never been near the old bailey in their lives in the realization of this fancy and they were roughly hustled and maltreated the transition to the sport of window-breaking and thence to the plundering of public houses was easy and natural at last after several hours when sundry summer-houses had been pulled down and some area railings had been torn up to arm the more belligerent spirits a rumour got about that the guards were coming before this rumour the crowd gradually melted away and perhaps the guards came and perhaps they never came and this was the usual progress of a mob mr cruncher did not assist at the closing sports but had remained behind in the churchyard to confer and condole with the undertakers the place had a soothing influence on him he procured a pipe from a neighbouring public-house and smoked it looking in at the railings and maturely considering the spot jerry said mr cruncher apostrophizing himself in his usual way you see that there cly that day and you see with your own eyes that he was a young un and a straight maiden having smoked his pipe out and ruminated a little longer he turned himself about that he might appear before the hour of closing on his station at tellson's whether his meditations on mortality had touched his liver or whether his general health had been previously at all amiss or whether he desired to show a little attention to an eminent man is not so much to the purpose as that he made a short call upon his medical adviser a distinguished surgeon on his way back young jerry relieved his father with dutiful interest and reported no job in his absence the bank closed the ancient clerks came out the usual watch was set and mr cruncher and his son went home to tea now i tell you where it is said mr cruncher to his wife on entering if as an honest tradesman me winters goes wrong to-night i shall make sure that you've been praying again me and i shall work you for it just the same as if i seen you do it the dejected mrs cruncher shook her head why you're at it afore my face said mr cruncher with signs of angry apprehension i'm saying nothing well then don't meditate nothing you might as well flop as meditate you may as well go again me one way as another drop it altogether yes jerry yes jerry repeated mr cruncher sitting down to tea ah it is yes jerry that's about it you may say yes jerry mr cruncher had no particular meaning in these sulky corroborations but made use of them as people not unfrequently do to express general ironical dissatisfaction you and your yes jerry said mr cruncher taking a bite out of his bread and butter and seeming to help it down with a large invisible oyster out of his saucer ah i think so i believe you you're going out to-night asked his decent wife when he took another bite yes i am may i go with you father asked his son briskly no you mayn't i'm a-going as your mother knows a-fishing that's where i'm going to going a-fishing your fishing rod get rather rusty don't it father never you mind shall you bring any fish home father if i don't you'll have short commons to-morrow returned that gentleman shaking his head that's questions enough for you i ain't a-going out till you've been long abed 
he devoted himself during the remainder of the evening to keeping a most vigilant watch on mrs cruncher and sullenly holding her in conversation that she might be prevented from meditating any petitions to his disadvantage with this view he urged his son to hold her in conversation also and led the unfortunate woman a hard life by dwelling on any causes of complaint he could bring against her rather than he would leave her for a moment to her own reflections the devoutest person could have rendered no greater homage to the efficacy of an honest prayer than he did in this distrust of his wife it was as if a professed unbeliever in ghosts should be frightened by a ghost story and mind you said mr cruncher no games to-morrow if i as an honest tradesman succeed in providing a jint of meat or two none of your not touching of it and sticking to bread if i as an honest tradesman am able to provide a little beer none of your declaring on water when you go to rome do as rome does rome will be an ugly customer to you if you don't i'm your rome you know then he began grumbling again. With your flying into the face of your own whittles and drink, I don't know how scarce you mayn't make the whittles and drink here by your flopping tricks and your unfeeling conduct. Look at your boy. He is yawn, ain't he? He's as thin as a lathe. Do you call yourself a mother and not know that a mother's first duty is to blow her boy out? This touched young Jerry on a tender place, who adjured his mother to perform her first duty, and, whatever else she did or neglected, above all things to lay especial stress on the discharge of that maternal function so affectingly and delicately indicated by his other parent. Thus the evening wore away with the Cruncher family, until young Jerry was ordered to bed, and his mother, laid under similar injunctions, obeyed them mr cruncher beguiled the earlier watches of the night with solitary pipes and did not start upon his excursion until nearly one o'clock towards that small and ghostly hour he rose up from his chair took a key out of his pocket opened a locked cupboard and brought forth a sack a crowbar of convenient size a rope and chain another fishing tackle of that nature disposing these articles about him in skilful manner he bestowed a parting defiance on mrs cruncher extinguished the light and went out young jerry who had only made a feint of undressing when he went to bed was not long after his father under cover of the darkness he followed out of the room followed down the stairs followed down the court followed out into the streets he was in no uneasiness concerning his getting into the house again for it was full of lodgers and the door stood ajar all night impelled by a laudable ambition to study the art and mystery of his father's honest calling young jerry keeping as close to house fronts walls and doorways as his eyes were close to one another held his honoured parent in view the honoured parent steering northward had not gone far when he was joined by another disciple of isaac walton and the two trudged on together within half an hour from the first starting they were beyond the winking lamps and the more than winking watchman and were out upon a lonely road another fisherman was picked up here and that so silently that if young jerry had been superstitious he might have supposed the second follower of the gentle craft to have all of a sudden split himself into two the three went on and young jerry went on until the three stopped under a bank overhanging the road upon the top of the bank was a low brick wall surmounted by an iron railing in the shadow of bank and wall the three turned out of the road and up a blind lane of which the wall there risen to some eight or ten feet high formed one side crouching down in a corner peeping up the lane the next object that young jerry saw was the form of his honoured parent pretty well defined against a watery and clouded moon nimbly scaling an iron gate he was soon over and then the second fisherman got over and then the third they all dropped softly on the ground within the gate and lay there a little listening perhaps then they moved away on their hands and knees it was now young jerry's turn to approach the gate which he did holding his breath 
Crouching down again in a corner there, and looking in, he made out the three fishermen creeping through some rank grass, and all the gravestones in the churchyard. It was a large churchyard that they were in, looking on like ghosts in white, while the church tower itself looked on like the ghost of a monstrous giant. They did not creep far before they stopped and stood upright, and then they began to fish. They fished with a spade at first. Presently the honoured parent appeared to be adjusting some instrument like a great corkscrew. Whatever tools they worked with, they worked hard, until the awful striking of the church clock so terrified young Jerry that he made off with his hair as stiff as his father's. But his long-cherished desire to know more about these matters not only stopped him in his running away, but lured him back again. They were still fishing perseveringly when he peeped in at the gate for a second time, but now they seemed to have got a bite. There was a screwing and complaining sound down below, and their bent figures were strained as if by a weight. By slow degrees the weight broke away the earth upon it and came to the surface. Young Jerry very well knew what it would be, but when he saw it, and saw his honoured parent about to wrench it open, he was so frightened, being new to the sight, that he made off again, and never stopped until he had run a mile or more. He would not have stopped then for anything less necessary than breath, it being a spectral sort of race that he ran, and one highly desirable to get to the end of. He had a strong idea that the coffin he had seen was running after him, and, pictured as hopping on behind him, bolt upright upon its narrow end, always at the point of overtaking him and hopping on at his side, perhaps taking his arm, it was a pursuer to shun. It was an inconsistent and ubiquitous fiend, too, for, while it was making the whole night behind him dreadful, he darted out into the roadway to avoid dark alleys, fearful of it coming hopping out of them, like a dropsical boy's kite without tail and wings. It hid in doorways, too, rubbing its horrible shoulders against doors, and drawing them up to its ears, as if it were laughing. It got into shadows on the road, and lay cunningly on its back to trip him up. All this time it was incessantly hopping on behind, and gaining on him, so that when the boy got to his own door he had reason for being half dead, and even then it would not leave him, but followed him upstairs with a bump on every stair, scrambled into bed with him, and bumped down dead and heavy on his breast when he fell asleep. From his oppressed slumber, young Jerry in his closet was awakened after daybreak and before sunrise by the presence of his father in the family room. Something had gone wrong with him, at least so young Jerry inferred, from the circumstance of his holding Mrs. Cruncher by the ears and knocking the back of her head against the headboard of the bed. "'I told you I would,' said Mr. Cruncher. "'And I did!' "'Jerry, Jerry, Jerry!' his wife implored. "'You oppose yourself to the profit of the business,' said Jerry, "'and me and my partners suffer. "'You was to honour and obey. "'Why the devil don't you?' "'I try to be a good wife, Jerry,' the poor woman protested with tears. "'Is it being a good wife to oppose your husband's business? "'Is it honouring your husband to dishonour his business? "'Is it obeying your husband to disobey him "'on the vital subject of his business? "'You hadn't taken to the dreadful business then, Jerry?' "'It's enough for you,' retorted Mr. Cruncher. "'To be the wife of an honest tradesman "'and not to occupy your female mind with calculations "'when he took to his trade or when he didn't, a honouring and obeying wife would let his trade alone altogether. Call yourself a religious woman? If you're a religious woman, give me a irreligious one. You will have no more natural sense of duty than the bed of this here Thames River as of a pile, and similarly it must be knocked into you. The altercation was conducted in a low tone of voice, and terminated in the honest tradesman kicking off his clay-soiled boots and lying down at his length on the floor. After taking a timid peep at him lying on his back, with his rusty hands under his head for a pillow, his son lay down too, and fell asleep again. 
There was no fish for breakfast, and not much of anything else. Mr. Cruncher was out of spirits and out of temper, and kept an iron pot-lib by him as a projectile for the correction of Mrs. Cruncher, in case he should observe any symptoms of her saying grace. He was brushed and washed at the usual hour, and set off with his son to pursue his ostensible calling. Young Jerry, walking with the stall under his arm at his father's side, along sunny and crowded Fleet Street, was a very different young Jerry from him of the previous night, running home through darkness and solitude from his grim pursuer. His cunning was fresh with the day, and his qualms were gone with the night, in which particulars it is not improbable that he had compeers in Fleet Street and the City of London that fine morning. "'Father,' said young Jerry, as they walked along, taking care to keep at arm's length and to have the stall well between them, "'What's a resurrection, man?' Mr. Cruncher came to a stop on the pavement before he answered, "'How should I know?' "'I thought you knowed everything, father,' said the artless boy. "'Hum, well,' returned Mr. Cruncher, going on again, and lifting off his hat to give his spikes free play." "'He's a tradesman.' "'What's his goods, father?' asked the brisk young Jerry. "'His goods,' said Mr. Cruncher, after turning it over in his mind, "'is a branch of scientific goods.' "'Person's bodies, ain't it, father?' asked the lively boy. "'I believe it is something of the sort,' said Mr. Cruncher. "'Oh, father, I should so like to be a resurrection man when I'm quite growed up. Mr. Cruncher was soothed, but shook his head in a dubious and moral way. "'It depends upon how you develop your talents. Be careful to develop your talents, and ne'er to say no more than you can help to nobody, and there's no telling at the present time what you may not come to be fit for.' As young Jerry, thus encouraged, went on a few yards in advance, to plant the stall in the shadow of the bar, Mr. Cruncher added to himself, "'Jerry, you honest tradesman, there's hope what that boy will yet be a blessing to you, and a recompense to you for his mother.'" End of Book 2, Chapter 14 <music> Chapter 15, Knitting there had been earlier drinking than usual in the wine-shop of Monsieur Defarge. As early as six o'clock in the morning, sallow faces peeping through its barred windows had descried other faces within, bending over measures of wine. Monsieur Defarge sold a very thin wine at the best of times, but it would seem to have been an unusually thin wine that he sold at this time. A sour wine, moreover, or a souring, for its influence on the mood of those who drank it was to make them gloomy. No vivacious bacchanalian flame leaped out of the pressed grape of Monsieur Defarge, but a smouldering fire that burnt in the dark lay hidden in the dregs of it. This had been the third morning in succession, on which there had been early drinking at the wine-shop of Monsieur Defarge. It had begun on Monday, and here was Wednesday come. There had been more of early brooding than drinking, for many men had listened and whispered and slunk about there from the time of the opening of the door, who could not have laid a piece of money on the counter to save their souls. These were to the full as interested in the place, however, as if they could have commanded whole barrels of wine, and they glided from seat to seat, and from corner to corner, swallowing talk in lieu of drink with greedy looks. Notwithstanding an unusual flow of company, the master of the wine-shop was not visible. He was not missed, for nobody who crossed the threshold looked for him, nobody asked for him, nobody wondered to see only Madame Defarge in her seat, presiding over the distribution of wine, with a bowl of battered small coins before her, as much defaced and beaten out of their original impress as the small coinage of humanity from whose ragged pocket they had come. A suspended interest and a prevalent absence of mind were perhaps observed by the spies who looked in at the wine-shop, as they looked in at every place, high and low, from the king's palace to the criminal's jail. 
games at cards languished, players at dominoes musingly built towers with them, drinkers drew figures on the table with spilt drops of wine. Madame Defarge herself picked out the pattern on her sleeve with her toothpick, and saw and heard something inaudible and invisible a long way off. Thus Saint Antoine in this vinous feature of his until midday. It was high noontide when two dusty men passed through his streets and under his swinging lamps, of whom one was Monsieur Defarge, the other a mender of roads in a blue cap. All a dust and a thirst, the two entered the wine shop. Their arrival had lighted a kind of fire in the breast of Saint Antoine, fast spreading as they came along, which stirred and flickered in flames of faces at most doors and windows. Yet no one had followed them, and no man spoke when they entered the wine shop, though the eyes of every man there were turned upon them. Good day, gentlemen, said Monsieur Defarge. It may have been a signal for loosening the general tongue. It elicited an answering chorus of, "'Good day!' "'It is bad weather, gentlemen,' said Defarge, shaking his head. Upon which every man looked at his neighbour, and then all cast down their eyes and sat silent, except one man, who got up and went out. "'My wife,' said Defarge, aloud, addressing Madame Defarge, I have travelled certain leagues with this good mender of roads, called Jacques. I met him, by accident, a day and a half's journey out of Paris. He is a good child, this mender of roads, called Jacques. Give him to drink, my wife. A second man got up and went out. Madame Defarge set wine before the mender of roads called Jacques, who doffed his blue cap to the company, and drank. In the breast of his blouse he carried some coarse dark bread. He ate of this between whiles, and sat munching and drinking near Madame Defarge's counter. A third man got up and went out. Defarge refreshed himself with a draught of wine, but he took less than was given to the stranger, as being himself a man to whom it was no rarity, and stood waiting until the countryman had made his breakfast. He looked at no one present, and no one now looked at him, not even Madame Defarge, who had taken up her knitting and was at work. "'Have you finished your repast, friend?' he asked, in due season. "'Yes, thank you. Come, then, you shall see the apartment that I told you you could occupy. It will suit you to a marvel.' Out of the wine-shop into the street, out of the street into a courtyard, out of the courtyard up a steep staircase, out of the staircase into a garret, formerly the garret where a white-haired man sat on a low bench, stooping forward and very busy, making shoes. No white-haired man was there now, but the three men were there who had gone out of the wine-shop singly and between them and the white-haired man afar off was the one small link that they had once looked in at him through the chinks in the wall. Defarge closed the door carefully, and spoke in a subdued voice. Jacques one, Jacques two, Jacques three, this is the witness encountered by appointment by me, Jacques four. He will tell you all. Speak, Jacques five. The mender of roads, blue cap in hand, wiped his swarthy forehead with it, and said, "'Where shall I commence, monsieur?' "'Commence,' was Monsieur Defarge's not unreasonable reply, "'at the commencement.' "'I saw him then, messieurs,' began the mender of roads, "'a year ago this running summer, underneath the carriage of the Marquis, hanging by the chain. Behold the manner of it, I leaving my work on the road, the sun going to bed, the carriage of the Marquis slowly ascending the hill, he hanging by the chain, like this.' Again the mender of roads went through the whole performance, in which he ought to have been perfect by that time, seeing that it had been the infallible resource and indispensable entertainment of his village during a whole year. Jacques once struck in, and asked if he had ever seen the man before. 
Never, answered the mender of roads, recovering his perpendicular. Jacques III demanded how he afterwards recognized him then. By his tall figure, said the mender of roads, softly, and with his finger at his nose. When Monsieur the Marquis demands that evening, Say, what is he like? I make response, tall as a spectre. You should have said, short as a dwarf, returned Jacques too. But what did I know? The deed was not then accomplished. Neither did he confide in me. Observe, under those circumstances even, I do not offer my testimony. Monsieur the Marquis indicates me with his finger, standing near our little fountain, and says, To me bring that rascal! My faith, monsieur, I offer nothing. He is right there, Jacques, murmured Defarge, to him who had interrupted. Go on. Good, said the mender of roads with an air of mystery. The tall man is lost, and he is sought. How many months? Nine, ten, eleven? No matter the number, said Defarge. He is well hidden, but at last he is unluckily found. Go on. I am again at work upon the hillside, and the sun is again about to go to bed. I am collecting my tools to descend to my cottage down in the village below, where it is already dark, when I raise my eyes and see coming over the hill six soldiers. In the midst of them is a tall man with his arms bound, tied to his sides, like this. With the aid of his indispensable cap, he represented a man with his elbows bound fast at his hips, with cords that were knotted behind him. I stand aside, messieurs, by my heap of stones, to see the soldiers and their prisoner pass, for it is a solitary road, that, where any spectacle is well worth looking at. And at first, as they approach, I see no more than that they are six soldiers with a tall man bound, and that they are almost black to my sight, except on the side of the sun going to bed, where they have a red edge, messieurs. Also, I see that their long shadows are on the hollow ridge on the opposite side of the road, and are on the hill above it, and are like the shadows of giants. Also, I see that they are covered with dust, and that the dust moves with them as they come, tramp, tramp. But when they advance quite near to me, I recognize the tall man, and he recognizes me. Ah, but he will be well content to precipitate himself over the hillside once again, as on the evening when he and I first encountered, close to the same spot. He described it as if he were there, and it was evident that he saw it vividly, perhaps he had not seen much in his life. I do not show the soldiers that I recognize the tall man. He does not show the soldiers that he recognizes me. We do it, and we know it, with our eyes. Come on, says the chief of that company, pointing to the village. Bring him fast to his tomb, and they bring him faster. I follow. His arms are swelled because of being bound so tight. His wooden shoes are large and clumsy, and he is lame. Because he is lame, and consequently slow, they drive him with their guns like this. He imitated the action of a man's being impelled forward by the butt-ends of muskets. As they descend the hill like madmen running a race, he falls. They laugh and pick him up again. His face is bleeding and covered with dust, but he cannot touch it. Thereupon they laugh again. They bring him into the village. All the village runs to look. They take him past the mill and up to the prison. All the village sees the prison gate open in the darkness of the night and swallow him like this. He opened his mouth as wide as he could, and shut it with the sounding snap of his teeth. Observant of his unwillingness to mar the effect by opening it again, Defarge said, "'Go on, Jacques.' All the village, pursued the mender of roads, on tiptoe, and in a low voice, withdraws. All the village whispers by the fountain. All the village sleeps. All the village dreams of that unhappy one, within the locks and bars of the prison on the crag, and never to come out of it except to perish. In the morning, with my tools upon my shoulder, eating my morsel of black bread as I go, I make a circuit by the prison on my way to my work. 
There I see him, high up behind the bars of the lofty iron cage, bloody and dusty as last night, looking through. He has no hand free to wave to me. I dare not call to him. He regards me like a dead man. Defarge and the three glanced darkly at one another. The looks of all of them were dark, repressed, and revengeful as they listened to the countryman's story. The manner of all of them, while it was secret, was authoritative too. They had the air of a rough tribunal, Jacques one and two sitting on the old pallet bed, each with his chin resting on his hand and his eyes intent on the road mender, Jacques three equally intent on one knee behind them, with his agitated hand always gliding over the network of fine nerves about his mouth and nose, Defarge standing between them and the narrator whom he had stationed in the light of the window by turns looking from him to them and from them to him go on jacques said defarge he remains up there in his iron cage some days the village looks at him by stealth for it is afraid but it always looks up from a distance at the prison on the crag and in the evening when the work of the day is achieved and it assembles to gossip at the fountain all faces are turned towards the prison formerly they were turned towards the posting-house now they are turned towards the prison they whisper at the fountain that although condemned to death he will not be executed they say that petitions have been presented in paris showing that he was enraged and made mad by the death of his child they say that a petition has been presented to the king himself what do i know it is possible perhaps yes perhaps no listen then jacques number one of that name sternly interposed know that a petition was presented to the king and queen all here yourself excepted saw the king take it in his carriage in the street sitting beside the queen it is defarge who you see here who at the hazard of his life darted out before the horses with the petition in his hand and once again listen jacques said the kneeling number three his fingers ever wandering over and over those fine nerves with a strikingly greedy air as if he hungered for something that was neither food nor drink the guard horse and foot surrounded the petitioner and struck him blows you hear i hear messieurs go on then said defarge again on the other hand they whisper at the fountain resumed the countryman that he is brought down into our country to be executed on the spot and that he will very certainly be executed they even whisper that because he has slain monseigneur and because monseigneur was the father of his tenants serfs what you will he will be executed as a parricide one old man says at the fountain that his right hand armed with the knife will be burnt off before his face that into wounds which will be made in his arms his breast and his legs there will be poured boiling oil melted lead hot resin wax and sulphur finally that he will be torn limb from limb by four strong horses that old man says all this was actually done to a prisoner who made an attempt on the life of the late king louis fifteen but how do i know if he lies i am not a scholar listen once again then jacques said the man with the restless hand and the craving air the name of that prisoner was damion and it was all done in open day in the open streets of this city of paris and nothing was more noticed than the vast concourse that saw it done than the crowd of ladies of quality and fashion who were full of eager attention to the last to the last jacques prolonged until nightfall when he had lost two legs and an arm and still breathed and it was done why how old are you thirty-five said the mender of roads who looked sixty it was done when you were more than ten years old you might have seen it enough said defarge with grim impatience long live the devil go on well 
Some whisper this, some whisper that. They speak of nothing else. Even the fountain appears to fall to that tune. At length, on Sunday night, when all the village is asleep, come soldiers, winding down from the prison, and their guns ring on the stones of the little street. Workmen dig, workmen hammer, soldiers laugh and sing. In the morning, by the fountain, there is raised a gallows forty feet high, poisoning the water. The mender of roads looked through rather than at the low ceiling and pointed as if he saw the gallows somewhere in the sky. All work is stopped, all assembled there. Nobody leads the cows out, the cows are there with the rest. At midday, the roll of drums. Soldiers have marched into the prison in the night, and he is in the midst of many soldiers. He is bound as before, and in his mouth there is a gag, tied so, with a tight string, making him look almost as if he laughed. He suggested it by creasing his face with his two thumbs from the corners of his mouth to his ears. On the top of the gallows is fixed the knife, blade upwards with its point in the air. He is hanged there forty feet high, and is left hanging, poisoning the water. They looked at one another as he used his blue cap to wipe his face, on which the perspiration had started afresh while he recalled the spectacle. It is frightful, messieurs. How can the women and the children draw water? Who can gossip of an evening under that shadow? Under it, have I said. When I left the village Monday evening as the sun was going to bed, and looked back from the hill, the shadow struck across the church, across the mill, across the prison, seemed to strike across the earth, messieurs, to where the sky rests upon it. The hungry man gnawed one of his fingers as he looked at the other three, and his finger quivered with the craving that was on him. That's all, Monsieur. I left at sunset, as I had been warned to do, and I walked on, that night and half next day, until I met, as I was warned I should, this comrade. With him I came on, now riding and now walking, through the rest of yesterday and through last night, and here you see me. After a gloomy silence, the first Jacques said, "'Good. You have acted and recounted faithfully. Will you wait for us a little, outside the door?' "'Very willingly,' said the mender of roads, whom Defarge escorted to the top of the stairs, and, leaving seated there, returned. The three had risen, and their heads were together when he came back to the garret. "'How say you, Jacques?' demanded number one. "'To be registered.' To be registered as doomed to destruction, returned Defarge. Magnificent, croaked the man with the craving. The chateau and all the race, inquired the first. The chateau and all the race, returned Defarge. Extermination! The hungry man repeated in a rapturous croak, Magnificent! And began gnawing another finger. "'Are you sure,' asked Jacques too of Defarge, "'that no embarrassment can arise from our manner of keeping the register? "'Without doubt it is safe, for no one beyond ourselves can decipher it. "'But shall we always be able to decipher it? "'Or, I ought to say, will she?' "'Jacques,' returned Defarge, drawing himself up. "'If Madame, my wife, undertook to keep the register in her memory alone, "'she would not lose a word of it, nor a syllable of it.' knitted in her own stitches and her own symbols it will always be as plain to her as the sun confide in madame defarge it would be easier for the weakest poltroon that lives to erase himself from existence than to erase one letter of his name or crimes from the knitted register of madame defarge there was a murmur of confidence and approval and then the man who hungered asked is this rustic to be sent back soon i hope so he is very simple is he not a little dangerous he knows nothing said defarge at least nothing more than would easily elevate himself to a gallows of the same height i charge myself with him let him remain with me i will take care of him and set him on the road he wishes to see the fine world the king the queen and court let him see them on sunday What? 
exclaimed the hungry man, staring. Is it a good sign that he wishes to see royalty and nobility? Jacques, said Defarge, judiciously show a cat milk if you wish her to thirst for it. Judiciously show a dog his natural prey if you wish him to bring it down one day. Nothing more was said, and the mender of roads, being found already dozing on the topmost stair, was advised to lay himself down on the pallet bed and take some rest. He needed no persuasion, and was soon asleep. Worse quarters than Defarge's wine-shop could easily have been found in Paris for a provincial slave of that degree. Saving for a mysterious dread of Madame, by which he was constantly haunted, his life was very new and agreeable. But Madame sat all day at her counter, so expressly unconscious of him, and so particularly determined not to perceive that his being there had any connection with anything below the surface, that he shook in his wooden shoes whenever his eye lighted on her. For he contended with himself that it was impossible to foresee what that lady might pretend next, and he felt assured that if she should take it into her brightly ornamented head to pretend that she had seen him do a murder, and afterwards flay the victim, she would infallibly go through with it until the play was played out. Therefore, when Sunday came, the mender of roads was not enchanted, though he said he was, to find that Madame was to accompany Monsieur and himself to Versailles. It was additionally disconcerting to have Madame knitting all the way there in a public conveyance. It was additionally disconcerting yet to have Madame in the crowd in the afternoon, still with her knitting in her hands, as the crowd waited to see the carriage of the King and Queen. "'You work hard, Madame,' said a man near her. "'Yes,' answered Madame Defarge, "'I have a good deal to do.' "'What do you make, Madame?' Many things, for instance. For instance, returned Madame Defarge composedly, shrouds. The man moved a little further away as soon as he could, and the mender of roads fanned himself with his blue cap, feeling it mightily close and oppressive. If he needed a king and queen to restore him, he was fortunate in having his remedy at hand, for soon the large-faced king and the fair-faced queen came in their golden coach, attended by the shining bull's-eye of their court, a glittering multitude of laughing ladies and fine lords, and in jewels and silks and powder and splendour, and elegantly spurning figures and handsomely disdainful faces of both sexes. The mender of roads bathed himself so much to his temporary intoxication that he cried, Long live the king! Long live the queen! Long live everybody and everything! as if he had never heard of ubiquitous Jacques in his time. Then there were gardens, courtyards, terraces, fountains, green banks, more king and queen, more bullseye, more lords and ladies, more long lived they all, until he absolutely wept with sentiment. During the whole of this scene, which lasted some three hours, he had plenty of shouting and weeping and sentimental company, and throughout Defarge held him by the collar, as if to restrain him from flying at the objects of his brief devotion and tearing them to pieces. "'Bravo!' said Defarge, clapping him on the back when it was over like a patron. "'You're a good boy!' The mender of roads was now coming to himself, and was mistrustful of having made a mistake in his late demonstrations. But no. "'You are the fellow we want,' said Defarge in his ear. "'You make these fools believe that it will last for ever. Then they are the more insolent, and it is the nearer ended.' "'Hey!' cried the mender of Rose reflectively. "'That's true.' These fools know nothing, while they despise your breath, and would stop it for ever and ever, in you or in a hundred like you, rather than in one of their own horses or dogs. They only know what your breath tells them. Let it deceive them, then, a little longer. It cannot deceive them too much. 
Madame Defarge looked superciliously at the client, and nodded in confirmation. "'As to you,' said she, "'you would shout and shed tears for anything if it made a show and a noise. Say, would you not?' "'Truly, madame, I think so, for the moment. "'If you were shown a great heap of dolls, "'and were set upon them to pluck them to pieces, "'and despoil them for your own advantage, "'you would pick out the richest and gayest, say, would you not? "'Truly, yes, madame. "'Yes, and if you were shown a flock of birds unable to fly, "'and were set upon them to strip them of their feathers for your own advantage, "'you would set upon the birds of the finest feathers, would you not? "'It is true, madame.' "'You have seen both dolls and birds to-day,' said Madame Defarge, with a wave of her hand towards the place where they had last been apparent. "'Now, go home.' End of chapter 15 of book 2 Chapter 16 Still Knitting Madame Defarge and Monsieur her husband returned amicably to the bosom of Saint Antoine, while a speck in a blue cap toiled through the darkness, and through the dust, and down the weary miles of avenue by the wayside, slowly tending towards that point of the compass where the chateau of Monsieur the Marquis, now in his grave, listened to the whispering trees. Such ample leisure had the stone faces, now, for listening to the trees and to the fountain, that the few village scarecrows who, in their quest for herbs to eat and fragments of dead stick to burn, strayed within sight of the great stone courtyard and terrace stairway, had it borne in upon their starved fancy that the expression of the faces was altered. A rumour, just lived in the village, had a faint and bare existence there, as its people had, that when the knife struck home the faces changed, from faces of pride to faces of anger and pain, also that when that dangling figure was hauled up forty feet above the fountain they changed again and bore a cruel look of being avenged, which they would henceforth bear for ever. In the stone face above the great window of the bedchamber where the murder was done, two fine dints were pointed out in the sculptured nose, which everybody recognised, and which nobody had seen of old. And on the scarce occasions when two or three ragged peasants emerged from the crowd to take a hurried peep at Monsieur the Marquis petrified, a skinny finger would not have pointed to them for a minute before they all started away among the moss and leaves, like the more fortunate hares who could find a living there. Chateau and hut, stone-faced and dangling figure, the red stain on the stone floor, and the pure water in the village well, thousands of acres of land, a whole province of France, all France itself, lay under the night sky, concentrated into a faint hairbreadth line. So does the whole world, with all its greatnesses and littlenesses, lie in a twinkling star, and as mere human knowledge can split a ray of light and analyse the manner of its composition, so sublimer intelligences may read in the feeble shining of this earth of ours every thought and act, every vice and virtue of every responsible creature on it. The Defarges, husband and wife, came lumbering under the starlight in their public vehicle to that gate of Paris whereunto their journey naturally tended. There was the usual stoppage at the barrier guardhouse, and the usual lanterns came glancing forth for the usual examination and inquiry. Monsieur Defarge alighted, knowing one or two of the soldiery there, and one of the police, the latter he was intimate with and affectionately embraced. When Saint Antoine had again enfolded the Defarges in his dusky wings, and they, having finally alighted near the saint's boundaries, were picking their way on foot through the black mud and offal of his streets, Madame Defarge spoke to her husband. "'Say then, my friend, what did Jacques of the police tell thee?' 
very little to-night but all he knows there is another spy commissioned for our quarter there may be many more for all that he can say but he knows of one eh hey, well said madame defarge raising her eyebrows with a cool business air it is necessary to register him how do they call that man he is english so much the better his name Bassard said Defarge, making it French by pronunciation. But he had been so careful to get it accurately that he then spelt it with perfect correctness. Bassad, repeated Madame. Good. Christian name? John. John Bassad, repeated Madame, after murmuring it once to herself. Good. His appearance, is it known? age about forty years height about five feet nine black hair complexion dark generally rather handsome visage eyes dark face thin long and sallow nose aquiline but not straight having a peculiar inclination towards the left cheek expression therefore sinister eh hey, my face it is a portrait said madame laughing he shall be registered to-morrow they turned into the wine-shop, which was closed, for it was midnight, and where Madame Defarge immediately took her post at her desk, counted the small monies that had been taken during her absence, examined the stock, went through the entries in the book, made other entries of her own, checked the serving-man in every possible way, and finally dismissed him to bed. Then she turned out the contents of the bowl of money for the second time, and began knotting them up in her handkerchief, in a chain of separate knots for safe-keeping through the night. All this while Defarge, with his pipe in his mouth, walked up and down, complacently admiring but never interfering, in which condition, indeed, as to the business and his domestic affairs, he walked up and down through life the night was hot and the shop close shut and surrounded by so foul a neighbourhood was ill-smelling m defarge's olfactory sense was by no means delicate but the stock of wine smelt much stronger than it ever tasted and so did the stock of rum and brandy and aniseed he whiffed the compound of sense anyway as he put down his smoked-out pipe you are fatigued said madame raising her glance as she knotted the money there are only the usual odours i am a little tired her husband acknowledged you are a little depressed too said madame whose quick eyes had never been so intent on the accounts but they had had a ray or two for him oh the men the men but my dear began defarge but my dear repeated madame nodding firmly but my dear you are faint of heart to-night my dear well then said defarge as if a thought were wrung out of his breast it is a long time it is a long time repeated his wife and when is it not a long time vengeance and retribution require a long time it is the rule it does not take a long time to strike a man with lightning said defarge how long demanded madame composedly does it take to make and store the lightning tell me defarge raised his head thoughtfully as if there were something in that too it does not take a long time said madame for an earthquake to swallow a town eh well tell me how long it takes to repair the earthquake a long time i suppose said defarge but when it is ready it takes place and grinds to pieces everything before it in the meantime it is always preparing though it is not seen or heard that is your consolation keep it she tied a knot with flashing eyes as if it throttled a foe i tell thee said madame extending her right hand for emphasis that although it is a long time on the road it is on the road and coming i tell thee it never retreats and never stops i tell thee it is always advancing look around and consider the lives of all the world that we know consider the faces of all the world that we know consider the rage and discontent to which the jacquerie addresses itself with more and more of 
certainty every hour. Can such things last? Bah! I mock you. My brave wife, returned Lafarge, standing before her with his head a little bent and his hands clasped at his back, like a docile and attentive pupil before his catechist. I do not question all this. But it has lasted a long time, and it is possible, you know well, my wife, it is possible, that it may not come during our lives. Eh, hey, well, how then, demanded Madame, tying another knot, as if there were another enemy strangled. Well, said Defarge, with a half-complaining and half-apologetic shrug, we shall not see the triumph. We shall have helped it returned madame with her extended hand in strong action nothing that we do is done in vain i believe with all my soul that we shall see the triumph but even if not even if i knew certainly not show me the neck of an aristocrat and tyrant and still i would then madame with her teeth set tied a very terrible knot indeed Hold, cried Defarge, reddening a little, as if he felt charged with cowardice. I too, my dear, will stop at nothing. Yes, but it is your weakness that you sometimes need to see your victim and your opportunity to sustain you. Sustain yourself without that. When the time comes, let loose the tiger and the devil, but wait for the time with the tiger and the devil chained, not shown, yet always ready. Madame enforced the conclusion of this piece of advice by striking her little counter with her chain of money as if she knocked its brains out, and then gathering the heavy handkerchief under her arm in a serene manner and observing that it was time to go to bed. Next noontide saw the admirable woman in her usual place in the wine-shop, knitting away assiduously. A rose lay beside her, and if she now and then glanced at the flower, it was with no infraction of her usual preoccupied air. There were a few customers, drinking or not drinking, standing or seated, sprinkled about. The day was very hot, and heaps of flies, who were extending their inquisitive and adventurous perquisitions into all the glutinous little glasses near Madame, fell dead at the bottom. Their decease made no impression on the other flies out promenading, who looked at them in the coolest manner, as if they themselves were elephants or something as far removed, until they met the same fate. Curious to consider how heedless flies are, perhaps they thought as much at court that sunny summer day. A figure entering at the door threw a shadow on Madame Defarge, which she felt to be a new one. She laid down her knitting and began to pin her rose in her headdress before she looked at the figure. It was curious. The moment Madame Defarge took up the rose, the customers ceased talking, and began gradually to drop out of the wine-shop. "'Good day, madame,' said the newcomer. "'Good day, monsieur.' She said it aloud, but added to herself as she resumed her knitting, "'Ha! Good day, age about forty, height about five feet nine, black hair, generally rather handsome visage, complexion dark, eyes dark, thin, long and shallow face, aquiline nose but not straight, having a peculiar inclination towards the left cheek, which imparts a sinister expression. Good day, one and all. Have the goodness to give me a little glass of old cognac, and a mouthful of cool fresh water, madame? madame complied with a polite air marvellous cognac this madame it was the first time it had ever been so complimented and madame defarge knew enough of its antecedents to know better she said however that the cognac was flattered and she took up her knitting the visitor watched her fingers for a few moments and took the opportunity of observing the place in general you knit with great skill madame I am accustomed to it. A pretty pattern, too. You think so? said Madame, looking at him with a smile. Decidedly. May one ask what it is for? Pastime, said Madame, still looking at him with a smile, while her fingers moved nimbly. 
Not for use? That depends. I may find a use for it one day if I do well, said Madame, drawing a breath and nodding her head with a stern kind of coquetry. I'll use it. It was remarkable, but the taste of Saint Antoine seemed to be decidedly opposed to a rose on the headdress of Madame Defarge. Two men had entered separately, and had been about to order drink, when, catching sight of that novelty, they faltered, made a pretence of looking about as if for some friend who was not there, and went away. Nor, of those who had been there when this visitor entered, was there one left. They had all dropped off. The spy had kept his eyes open, but had been able to detect no sign. They had lounged away in a poverty-stricken, purposeless, accidental manner, quite natural and unimpeachable. John, thought Madame, checking off her work as her fingers knitted, and her eyes looked at the stranger. Stay long enough, and I shall knit Barsad before you go. You have a husband, Madame? I have. Children? No children. Business seems bad? Business is very bad. The people are so poor. Ah, the unfortunate, miserable people, so oppressed too, as you say. "'As you say,' Madame retorted, correcting him, and deftly knitting an extra something into his name that boded him no good. "'Pardon me, certainly it was I who said so, but you naturally think so, of course.' "'I think,' returned Madame in a high voice, I and my husband have enough to do to keep this wine-shop open without thinking. All we think here is how to live. That is the subject we think of, and it gives us from morning to night enough to think about without embarrassing our heads concerning others. I think for others? No, no. The spy, who was there to pick up any crumbs he could find or make, did not allow his baffled state to express itself in his sinister face, but stood with an air of gossiping gallantry, leaning his elbow on Madame Defarge's little counter, and occasionally sipping his cognac. A bad business, this Madame of Gaspard's execution. Ah, the poor Gaspard, with a sigh of great compassion. "'My faith,' returned Madame, coolly and lightly, "'if people use knives for such purposes, they have to pay for it. "'He knew beforehand what the price of his luxury was. "'He has paid the price.' "'I believe,' said the spy, dropping his soft voice to a tone that invited confidence, and expressing an injured revolutionary susceptibility in every muscle of his wicked face, I believe there is much compassion and anger in this neighbourhood touching the poor fellow and between ourselves. Is there? asked Madame vacantly. Is there not? Here is my husband, said Madame Defarge. As the keeper of the wine-shop entered at the door, the spy saluted him by touching his hat, and saying with an engaging smile, Good day, Jacques! Defarge stopped short and stared at him. "'Good day, Jacques,' the spy repeated, with not quite so much confidence, or quite so easy a smile under the stare. "'You deceive yourself, monsieur,' returned the keeper of the wine-shop. "'You mistake me for another. That is not my name. I am Ernest Defarge.' "'It is all the same,' said the spy, airily, but discomfited, too. "'Good day.' "'Good day,' answered Defarge, dryly. "'I was saying to Madame, with whom I had the pleasure of chatting when you entered, "'that they tell me there is, and no wonder, much sympathy and anger "'in Saint Antoine touching the unhappy fate of poor Gaspard.' "'No one has told me so,' said Defarge, shaking his head. "'I know nothing of it.' Having said it, he passed behind the little counter, and stood with his hand on the back of his wife's chair, looking over that barrier at the person to whom they were both opposed, and whom either of them would have shot with the greatest satisfaction. 
The spy, well used to his business, did not change his unconscious attitude, but drained his little glass of cognac, took a sip of fresh water, and asked for another glass of cognac. Madame Defarge poured it out for him, took to her knitting again, and hummed a little song over it. "'You seem to know this quarter well, that is to say, better than I do,' observed Defarge. "'Not at all, but I hope to know it better. I am so profoundly interested in its miserable inhabitants.' "'Ha!' Huh, muttered Defarge. "'The pleasure of conversing with you, Monsieur Defarge, recalls to me,' pursued the spy, "'that I have the honour of cherishing some interesting associations with your name.' indeed said defarge with much indifference yes indeed when dr manette was released you his old domestic had the charge of him i know he was delivered to you you see i am informed of the circumstances such is the fact certainly said defarge he had had it conveyed to him in an accidental touch of his wife's elbow as she knitted and warbled that he would do best to answer but always with brevity it was to you said the spy that his daughter came and it was from your care that his daughter took him accompanied by a neat brown monsieur how is he called in a little wig lorry of the bank of telson and company over to england such is the fact repeated defarge very interesting remembrances said the spy i have known dr manette and his daughter in england yes said defarge "'You don't hear much about them now?' said the spy. "'No,' said Defarge. "'In effect,' Madame struck in, looking up from her work and her little song, "'we never hear about them. "'We received the news of their safe arrival, and perhaps another letter, or perhaps two, "'but since then they have gradually taken their road in life, we ours, "'and we have held no correspondence.' "'Perfectly so, Madame,' replied the spy. "'She is going to be married.' going echoed madame she was pretty enough to have been married long ago you english are cold it seems to me oh you know i am english i perceive your tongue is returned madame and what the tongue is i suppose the man is he did not take the identification as a compliment but he made the best of it and turned it off with a laugh after sipping his cognac to the end he added yes miss manette is going to be married but not to an englishman to one who like herself is french by birth and speaking of gaspard ah poor gaspard it was cruel cruel it is a curious thing that she is going to marry the nephew of monsieur the marquis for whom gaspard was exalted to that height of so many feet in other words the present marquis but he lives unknown in England. He is no Marquis there. He is Mr. Charles Darnay. Dolnay is the name of his mother's family. Madame Defarge knitted steadily, but the intelligence had a palpable effect upon her husband. Do what he would, behind the little counter, as to the striking of a light and the lighting of his pipe, he was troubled, and his hand was not trustworthy the spy would have been no spy if he had failed to see it or to record it in his mind having made at least this one hit whatever it might prove to be worth and no customers coming in to help him to any other mr barsad paid for what he had drunk and took his leave taking occasion to say in a genteel manner before he departed that he looked forward to the pleasure of seeing monsieur and madame defarge again for some minutes after he had emerged into the outer presence of saint antoine the husband and wife remained exactly as he had left them lest he should come back can it be true said defarge in a low voice looking down at his wife as he stood smoking with his hand on the back of her chair what he has said of mademoiselle manette as he has said it returned madame lifting her eyebrows a little it is probably false but it may be true if it is defarge began and stopped if it is repeated his wife and if it does come while we live to see it triumph i hope for her sake destiny will keep her husband out of france 
Her husband's destiny, said Madame Defarge, with her usual composure, will take him where he is to go, and will lead him to the end that is to end him. That is all I know. But it is very strange, now at least, is it not very strange, said Defarge, rather pleading with his wife to induce her to admit it, that, after all our sympathy for Monsieur her father, and herself, her husband's name should be prescribed under your hand, at this moment, by the side of that infernal dogs who has just left us? "'Stranger things than that will happen when it does come,' answered Madame. "'I have them both here of a certainty, and they are both here for their merits. That is enough.' She rolled up her knitting when she had said those words, and presently took the rose out of the handkerchief that was round about her head. Either Saint Antoine had an instinctive sense that the objectionable decoration was gone, or Saint Antoine was on the watch for its disappearance. Howbeit the saint took courage to lounge in very shortly afterwards, and the wine shop recovered its habitual aspect. In the evening, at which season of all others Saint Antoine turned himself inside out, and sat on doorsteps and window ledges, and came to the corners of vile streets and courts for a breath of air, Madame Defarge, with her work in her hand, was accustomed to pass from place to place, and from group to group. A missionary! There were many like her, such as the world would do well never to breed again. All the women knitted. They knitted worthless things, but the mechanical work was a mechanical substitute for eating and drinking. The hands moved for the jaws and the digestive apparatus. If the bony fingers had been still, the stomachs would have been more famine-pinched. But as the fingers went, the eyes went, and the thoughts, and as Madame Defarge moved on from group to group, all three went quicker and fiercer among every little knot of women that she had spoken with and left behind. Her husband smoked at his door, looking after her with admiration. A great woman, said he, a strong woman, a grand woman, a frightfully grand woman. Darkness closed around, and then came the ringing of church bells, and the distant beating of the military drums in the palace courtyard, as the women sat knitting, knitting. Darkness encompassed them. Another darkness was closing in as surely, when the church bells then ringing pleasantly in many an airy steeple over France should be melted into thundering cannon, when the military drums should be beating to drown a wretched voice voice, that night all potent as the voice of power and plenty, freedom and life. So much was closing in about the women who sat knitting, knitting, that they, their very selves, were closing in around a structure yet unbuilt, where they were to sit knitting, knitting, counting, dropping heads. End of Book 2, Chapter 16 Chapter 17. One Night. Never did the sun go down with a brighter glory on the quiet corner in Soho than one memorable evening, when the doctor and his daughter sat under the plane tree together. Never did the moon rise with a milder radiance over great London than on that night when it found them still seated under the tree and shone upon their faces through its leaves. Lucy was to be married to-morrow. She had reserved this last evening for her father, and they sat alone under the plane tree. "'You are happy, dear father?' "'Quite, my child.' They had said little, though they had been there a long time. When it was yet light enough to work and read, she had neither engaged herself in her usual work, nor had she read to him. She had employed herself in both ways, at his side under the tree, many and many a time, but this time was not quite like any other, and nothing could make it so. And I am very happy to-night, dear father. I am deeply happy in the love that heaven has so blessed, my love for Charles, and Charles' love for me. But, if my life were not to be still consecrated to you, 
or if my marriage was so arranged as that it would part us even by the length of a few of these streets, I should be more unhappy and self-reproachful now than I can tell you. Even as it is... Even as it were, she could not command her voice. In the sad moonlight she clasped him by the neck and laid her face upon his breast. In the moonlight which is always sad, as the light of the sun itself is, as the light called human life is, at its coming and going. Dearest dear, can you tell me this last time that you feel quite, quite sure no new affections of mine and no new duties of mine will ever interpose between us? I know it well, but do you know it? In your own heart do you feel quite certain? Her father answered with a cheerful firmness of conviction he could scarcely have assumed. Quite sure, my darling. More than that, he added, as he tenderly kissed her, my future is far brighter, Lucy, seen through your marriage, than it could have been, nay, than it ever was without it. If I could hope that, my father— believe it love indeed it is so consider how natural and how plain it is my dear that it should be so you devoted and young cannot fully appreciate the anxiety i have felt that your life should not be wasted she moved her hand towards his lips but he took it in his and repeated the word wasted my child should not be wasted struck aside from the natural order of things for my sake your unselfishness cannot entirely comprehend how much my mind has gone on this but only ask yourself how could my happiness be perfect while yours was incomplete if i had never seen charles my father i should have been quite happy with you he smiled at her unconscious admission that she would have been unhappy without Charles, having seen him, and replied, My child, you did see him, and it is Charles. If it had not been Charles, it would have been another, or if it had been no other, I should have been the cause, and then the dark part of my life would have cast its shadow beyond myself, and would have fallen on you. It was the first time, except at the trial, of her ever hearing him refer to the period of his suffering. It gave her a strange, a new sensation, while his words were in her ears, and she remembered it long afterwards. See, said the doctor of Beauvais, raising his hand towards the moon, I have looked at her from my prison window, when I could not bear her light. I have looked at her when it has been such torture to me to think of her shining upon what I had lost, that I have beaten my head against my prison walls. I have looked at her in a state so dun and lethargic that I have thought of nothing but the number of horizontal lines I could draw across her at the full and the number of perpendicular lines with which I could intersect them. He added in his inward and pondering manner as he looked at the moon, It was twenty, either way, I remember, and the twentieth was difficult to squeeze in. The strange thrill with which she heard him go back to that time deepened as he dwelt upon it, but there was nothing to shock her in the manner of his reference. He only seemed to contrast his present cheerfulness and felicity with the dire endurance that was over. I have looked at her, speculating thousands of times upon the unborn child from whom I had been rent, whether it was alive, whether it had been born alive, or the poor mother's shock had killed it, whether it was a son who would some day avenge his father. There was a time in my imprisonment when my desire for vengeance was unbearable. Whether it was a son who would never know his father's story, who might even live to weigh the possibility of his father's having disappeared of his own will and act, whether it was a daughter who would grow to be a woman. She drew closer to him and kissed his cheek and his hand. I have pictured my daughter to myself as perfectly forgetful of me, rather altogether ignorant of me and unconscious of me. I have cast up the years of her age, year after year. I have seen her married to a man who knew nothing of my fate. I have altogether perished from the remembrance of the living, and in the next generation my place was a blank. 
my father even to hear that you had such thoughts of a daughter who never existed strikes to my heart as if i had been that child you lucy it is out of the consolation and restoration you have brought to me that these remembrances arise and pass between us and the moon on this last night what did i say just now she knew nothing of you she cared nothing for you so but on other moonlight nights when the sadness and the silence have touched me in a different way have affected me with something as like a sorrowful sense of peace as any emotion that had pain for its foundations could i have imagined her as coming to me in my cell and leading me out into the freedom beyond the fortress i have seen her image in the moonlight often as i now see you except that i never held her in my arms it stood between the little grated window and the door but you understand that that was not the child i am speaking of the figure was not the the image the fancy no that was another thing it stood before my disturbed sense of sight but it never moved the phantom that my mind pursued was another and more real child of her outward appearance i know no more than that she was like her mother the other had that likeness too as you have but was not the same can you follow me lucy hardly i think i doubt you must have been a solitary prisoner to understand these perplexed distinctions his collected and calm manner could not prevent her blood from running cold as he thus tried to anatomize his old condition in that more peaceful state i have imagined her in the moonlight coming to me and taking me out to show me that the home of her married life was full of her loving remembrance of her lost father my picture was in her room and i was in her prayers her life was active cheerful useful but my poor history pervaded it all i was that child my father i was not half so good but in my love that was i and she showed me her children said the doctor of beauvais and they had heard of me and had been taught to pity me when they passed the prison of the state they kept far from its frowning walls and looked up at its bars and spoke in whispers she could never deliver me i imagined that she always brought me back after showing me such things but then blessed with the relief of tears i fell upon my knees and blessed her i am that child i hope my father oh my dear my dear will you bless me as fervently to-morrow lucy i recall these old troubles in the reason that i have to-night for loving you better than words can tell and thanking god for my great happiness my thoughts when they were wildest never rose near the happiness that i have known with you and that we have before us he embraced her solemnly commended her to heaven and humbly thanked heaven for having bestowed her on him by and by they went into the house. There was no one bidden to the marriage but Mr. Lorry. There was even to be no bridesmaid but the gaunt Miss Pross. The marriage was to make no change in their place of residence. They had been able to extend it by taking to themselves the upper rooms formerly belonging to the apocryphal invisible lodger, and they desired nothing more dr manette was very cheerful at the little supper they were only three at table and miss pross made the third he regretted that charles was not there was more than half disposed to object to the loving little plot that kept him away and drank to him affectionately so the time came for him to bid lucy good night and they separated but in the stillness of the third hour of the morning lucy came downstairs again and stole into his room not free from unshaped fears beforehand all things however were in their places all was quiet and he lay asleep his white hair picturesque on the untroubled pillow and his hands lying quiet on the coverlet she put her needless candle in the shadow at a distance crept up to his bed and put her lips to his 
then leaned over him and looked at him. Into his handsome face the bitter waters of captivity had worn, but he covered up their tracks with a determination so strong that he held the mastery of them even in his sleep. A more remarkable face in its quiet, resolute, and guarded struggle with an unseen assailant was not to be beheld in all the wide dominions of sleep that night. She timidly laid her hand on his dear breast, and put up a prayer that she might ever be as true to him as her love aspired to be, and as his sorrows deserved. Then she withdrew her hand, and kissed his lips once more, and went away. So the sunrise came, and the shadows of the leaves of the plane tree moved upon his face as softly as her lips had moved in praying for him. End of Book 2, Chapter 17 Chapter 18, Nine Days The marriage day was shining brightly, and they were ready outside the closed door of the doctor's room, where he was speaking with Charles Darnay. They were ready to go to church, the beautiful bride, Mr. Lorry, and Miss Pross, to whom the event, through a gradual process of reconcilement to the inevitable, would have been one of absolute bliss but for the yet lingering consideration that her brother Solomon should have been the bridegroom. And so, said Mr. Lorry, who could not sufficiently admire the bride, and who had been moving round her to take in every point of her quiet, pretty dress, and so it was for this, my sweet Lucy, that I brought you across the channel, such a baby! Lord bless me! How little I thought what I was doing! How lightly I valued the obligation I was conferring on my friend Mr. Charles! You didn't mean it, remarked the matter-of-fact Miss Pross, and therefore how could you know it? Nonsense! Really? Well, but don't cry, said the gentle Mr. Lorry. I am not crying, said Miss Pross. You are! I am my pross. By this time Mr. Lorry dared to be pleasant with her on occasion. You were just now. I saw you do it, and I don't wonder at it. Such a present of plate as you have made em is enough to bring tears into anybody's eyes. There's not a fork or a spoon in the collection, said Miss Pross, that I didn't cry over last night after the box came, till I couldn't see it. I am highly gratified, said Mr. Lorry, though, upon my honour, I had no intention of rendering those trifling articles of remembrance invisible to any one. Dear me, this is an occasion that makes a man speculate on all he has lost. Dear, 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 to think that there might have been a Mrs. Lorry any time these fifty years almost. Not at all, from Miss Pross. You think that there never might have been a Mrs. Lorry? asked the gentleman of that name. Pooh, rejoined Miss Pross, you were a bachelor in your cradle. Well, observed Mr. Lorry, beamingly adjusting his little wig, that seems probable, too. And you were cut out for a bachelor, pursued Miss Pross, before you were put in your cradle. Then, I think, said Mr. Lorry, that I was very unhandsomely dealt with, and that I ought to have had a voice in the selection of my pattern. Enough! Now, my dear Lucy, drawing his arm soothingly round her waist, I hear them moving in the next room, and Miss Pross and I, as two formal folks of business, are anxious not to lose the final opportunity of saying something to you that you wish to hear. You leave your good father, my dear, in hands as earnest and as loving as your own. He shall be taken every conceivable care of during the next fortnight, while you are in Warwickshire and thereabouts. Even Telson shall go to the wall, comparatively speaking, before him. And when, at the fortnight's end, he comes to join you and your beloved husband on your other fortnight's trip in Wales, you shall say that we have sent him to you in the best health and in the happiest frame. Now, I hear somebody's step coming to the door. Let me kiss my dear girl with an old-fashioned bachelor blessing before somebody comes to claim his own. 
For a moment he held the fair face from him, to look at the well-remembered expression on the forehead, and then laid the bright golden hair against his little brown wig with a genuine tenderness and delicacy which, if such things be old-fashioned, were as old as Adam. The door of the doctor's room opened, and he came out with Charles Darnay. He was so deadly pale, which had not been the case when they went in together, that no vestige of colour was to be seen in his face. But in the composure of his manner he was unaltered, except that to the shrewd glance of Mr. Lorry it disclosed some shadowy indication that the old air of avoidance and dread had lately passed over him like a cold wind. He gave his arm to his daughter, and took her downstairs to the chariot which Mr. Lorry had hired in honour of the day. The rest followed in another carriage, and soon, in a neighbouring church where no strange eyes looked on, Charles Darnay and Lucy Manette were happily married. Besides the glancing tears that shone among the smiles of the little group when it was done, some diamonds, very bright and sparkling, glanced on the bride's hand, which were newly released from the dark obscurity of one of Mr. Lorry's pockets. They returned home to breakfast, and all went well, and in due course the golden hair that had mingled with the poor shoemaker's white locks in the Paris garret were mingled with them again in the morning sunlight on the threshold of the door at parting. It was a hard parting, though it was not for long. But her father cheered her, and said at last, gently disengaging himself from her enfolding arms, "'Take her, child, she is yours!' And her agitated hand waved to them from a chaise window, and she was gone. The corner being out of the way of the idle and curious, and the preparations having been very simple and few, the doctor, Mr. Lorry, and Miss Pross were left quite alone. It was when they turned into the welcome shade of the cool old hall that Mr. Lorry observed a great change to have come over the doctor, as if the golden arm uplifted there had struck him a poisoned blow. He had naturally repressed much, and some revulsion might have been expected in him when the occasion for repression was gone, but it was the old, scared, lost look that troubled Mr. Lorry, and through his absent manner of clasping his head and drearily wandering away into his own room when they got upstairs, Mr. Lorry was reminded of Defarge, the wine-shop keeper, and the starlight ride. I think, he whispered to Miss Pross, after anxious consideration, I think we had best not speak to him just now, or at all disturb him. I must look in at Telson's, so I will go there at once, and come back presently. Then we will take him a ride into the country, and dine there, and all will be well. It was easier for Mr. Lorry to look in at Telson's than to look out of Telson's. He was detained two hours. When he came back, he ascended the old staircase alone, having asked no question of the servant. Going thus into the doctor's rooms, he was stopped by a low sound of knocking. "'Good God!' he said with a start. "'What's that?' Miss Pross, with a terrified face, was at his ear. "'Oh, me! Oh, me! All is lost!' cried she, wringing her hands. "'What is to be told to Lady Bird? He doesn't know me, and is making shoes!' Mr. Lorry said what he could to calm her, and went himself into the doctor's room. The bench was turned towards the light, as it had been when he had seen the shoemaker at his work before, and his head was bent down, and he was very busy. "'Dr. Manette, my dear friend, Dr. Manette!' The doctor looked at him for a moment, half inquiringly, half as if he were angry at being spoken to, and bent over his work again. He had laid aside his coat and waistcoat. His shirt was open at the throat, as it used to be when he did that work, and even the old haggard, faded surface of face had come back to him. He worked hard, impatiently, as if in some sense of having been interrupted. 
Mr. Lorry glanced at the work in his hand, and observed that it was a shoe of the old size and shape. He took up another that was lying by him, and asked what it was. "'A young lady's walking shoe,' he muttered, without looking up. "'It ought to have been finished long ago. Let it be. "'But, Dr. Manette, look at me!' He obeyed in the old mechanically submissive manner, without pausing in his work. "'You know me, my dear friend? Think again. This is not your proper occupation. Think, dear friend!' nothing would induce him to speak more he looked up for an instant at a time when he was requested to do so but no persuasion would extract a word from him he worked and worked and worked in silence and words fell on him as they would have fallen on an echoless wall or on the air the only ray of hope that mr lorry could discover was that he sometimes furtively looked up without being asked in that there seemed a faint expression of curiosity or perplexity as though he were trying to reconcile some doubts in his mind two things at once impressed themselves on mr lorry as important above all others the first that this must be kept secret from lucy the second that it must be kept secret from all who knew him in conjunction with miss pross he took immediate steps towards the latter precaution by giving out that the doctor was not well and required a few days of complete rest in aid of the kind deception to be practised on his daughter miss pross was to write describing his having been called away professionally and referring to an imaginary letter of two or three hurried lines in his own hand represented to have been addressed to her by the same post these measures advisable to be taken in any case mr lorry took in the hope of his coming to himself if that should happen soon he kept another course in reserve which was to have a certain opinion that he thought the best on the doctor's case in the hope of his recovery and of resort to this third course being thereby rendered practicable mr lorry resolved to watch him attentively with as little appearance as possible of doing so he therefore made arrangements to absent himself from Telson's for the first time in his life, and took his post by the window in the same room. He was not long in discovering that it was worse than useless to speak to him, since, on being pressed, he became worried. He abandoned that attempt on the first day, and resolved merely to keep himself always before him as a silent protest against the delusion into which he had fallen, or was falling. He remained, therefore, in his seat near the window, reading and writing, and expressing in as many pleasant and natural ways as he could think of that it was a free place." Dr. Manette took what was given him to eat and drink, and worked on that first day until it was too dark to see. Worked on half an hour after Mr. Lorry could not have seen for his life to read or write. When he put his tools aside as useless until morning, Mr. Lorry rose and said to him, "'Will you go out?' He looked down at the floor on either side of him in the old manner, looked up in the old manner, and repeated in the old, low voice, Out? Yes, for a walk with me. Why not? He made no effort to say why not, and said not a word more. But Mr. Lorry thought he saw, as he leaned forward on his bench in the dusk, with his elbows on his knees and his head in his hands, that he was in some misty way asking himself, why not? The sagacity of the man of business perceived an advantage here, and determined to hold it. Miss Pross and he divided the night into two watches, and observed him at intervals from the adjoining room. He paced up and down for a long time before he lay down, but when he did finally lay himself down he fell asleep. In the morning he was up betimes, and went straight to his bench and to work. On this second day Mr. Lorry saluted him cheerfully by his name, and spoke to him on topics that had been of late familiar to them, 
He returned no reply, but it was evident that he heard what was said, and that he thought about it, however confusedly. This encouraged Mr. Lorry to have Miss Pross in with her work several times during the day. At those times they quietly spoke of Lucy, and of her father then present, precisely in the usual manner, and as if there was nothing amiss. This was done without any demonstrative accompaniment, not long enough or often enough to harass him, and it lightened Mr. Lorry's friendly heart to believe that he looked up oftener, and that he appeared to be stirred by some perception of inconsistencies surrounding him. When it fell dark again, Mr. Lorry asked him as before, "'Dear doctor, will you go out?' As before, he repeated, out yes for a walk with me why not this time mr lorry feigned to go out when he could extract no answer from him and after remaining absent for an hour returned in the meanwhile the doctor had removed to the seat in the window and had sat there looking down at the plane tree but on mr lorry's return he slipped away to his bench the time went very slowly on, and Mr. Lorry's hope darkened, and his heart grew heavier again, and grew yet heavier and heavier every day. The third day came and went, the fourth, the fifth, five days, six days, seven days, eight days, nine days. With a hope ever darkening, and with a heart always growing heavier and heavier, Mr. Lorry passed through this anxious time. The secret was well kept, and Lucy was unconscious and happy. But he could not fail to observe that the shoemaker, whose hand had been a little out at first, was growing dreadfully skilful, and that he had never been so intent on his work, and that his hands had never been so nimble and expert as in the dusk of the ninth evening. End of Book Two, Chapter Eighteen. 